It is so beautiful out here. Out in the wide expanse of nature, we see signs of life all around. And as you can see, I'm not wearing a mask. I am social distancing. There's not a soul for quite a long ways. But that's not why I'm out here. I'm out here to talk to you. Well, to talk to us, to explore something we've been exploring for the last several weeks. Remember, I shared this verse. It's a verse we all know, perhaps the, one of the best known passages in all of scripture. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you remember a couple weeks ago, I asked you the question, what is real? What is really real? And how do we know? And I postulated to you that the essence of that question, in order to answer that question, we have to have a close and personal encounter with our ultimate reality. We talked about how people around the world in different cultures from different backgrounds answer that question, from Muslims to animists to uh, people of all different faiths or no faith at all, people who hold materialism, for example, like many people in this country, how we answer this question of ultimate reality, but how the answer of the Christian is different, how we fa base our ultimate reality upon the pages of God's Word, upon the existence of God, and even more than that, upon the ultimate reality of his character, his character of love. That God is love, and that because he loves, he gave. That last week we explored how the very essence of his existence is centered in this principle of love. That God does not exist alone, but that he, the Father, and the Son also, God, exist together in an eternal and loving relationship. And that in giving his son, like Abraham sacrificing Isaac upon the altar, God gave of himself in a way that, that we can hardly imagine, a way that, that we can't even wrap our minds around. He sacrificed himself. We talked about that in symbol with Abraham, with Isaac, and how at the last moment, as Abraham's hand was raised to plunge the knife through his son, his hand was stayed. An angel came and said, it is enough. And that there in the thicket, if you remember, there in the thicket was caught a ram. And Abraham took it and offered it in his son's place. But today I want to explore another story. It's a story that we all know very well. Not the story of Abraham, but the story of the one whom Isaac represented. The story of the one who came and who offered himself as a sacrifice. That time when no, no hand was there to stop the knife from plunging down. No hand was there to stop the nails from crashing through those faultless hands and nailing him to a cross. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself now. Before we get into the story, I'd like to offer a word of prayer, and then we'll go on a little journey through these beautiful and quiet woods. Father in heaven, Lord, as we open the pages of your word, as we spend a little time now contemplating the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, and what that means for us today. Lord, I pray that you will guide our hearts and our minds to you. I pray that you will be with each one of my listening friends, church members, people from around the world perhaps, wherever they are, Lord, that you will bless them in a mighty and special way. And may our hearts be open to receive your word is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the woods are open, let's get going.
the further we go in these woods, the darker it seems to get. I can see a little light glimmering on the horizon there. But in the treetops, I can hear right now a rushing wind, almost as if a storm is coming. We're looking for the light. And in fact, I've titled today's message, Triumph Over Darkness. But before we see the light, before we see the triumph, I'm afraid we'll have to experience some darkness. The blackness of the night could not have been darker as his grief-stricken followers relived those memories over and over again in their minds. The scenes that had just unfolded before them like a bad dream. His anguished prayer in the garden. His sudden arrest. The shameful mockery of a trial. The sound of the flogging. His groans the sight of his bleeding and bruised body as he struggled to carry that heavy cross up the hill to his place of execution. The sound of the hammer as it struck the nails through those tender hands. His cry on the cross. His prayer of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. Forgive his enemies for they know not what they do. His cry, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That last agonizing breath, the silence. Oh, they could still picture that limp form hanging there. The earthquake that shook the ground, the darkness. The darkness, yes, that had enshrouded the cross as he hung there before he died. It seemed to enshroud their very hearts now. As they had nothing, nothing left to do but to hide in that upper room from the malice of the Jews. For surely they wouldn't stop at crucifying the Lord. Not until they had exterminated every one of his followers. And so they cowered in the darkness waiting. Waiting for what? Oh, there was one thing left to do. You see, it had been late Friday afternoon before they could even secure the body of Jesus. Really, that was a miracle to think of it that Joseph of Arimathea had seemingly come out of the woodwork now in this great time of need and had used his influence with Pilate to allow them to have the body of Jesus. He had provided his own new tomb as a place to be his final resting place. And oh, to their grieving hearts, it was, it was just a little bit of comfort to know that he would have a proper burial. But as the Sabbath had opened, they weren't able to finish the process of embalming his remains. And so, as they waited through the Sabbath hours, the women planning what they would do as soon as the Sabbath should close, they waited in the darkness. It was early in the morning before the women were able to make their trek slowly, sadly out to that garden tomb. But who will roll away the stone? They started questioning among themselves. They hadn't thought of that. Little did they know that all night a Roman guard had been stationed there at the tomb to prevent any disciples from coming and tampering with the body. 
Little could they discern the countless evil angels that surrounded that tomb, and in fact the devil himself, hoping against hope to keep Jesus forever, forever locked in its dark passageway. But inside that tomb lay one who was stronger than death. And before they could arrive at the tomb, the scene would incredibly change. If these women could only have seen past their tears, if only they could have remembered Jesus' words spoken at the tomb of Lazarus only a few days before, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. My friends, in the presence of Jesus Christ, nothing, no one can die. Jesus is the author of life. Look around at the beauty of this scenery. Look at right here. It seems as though the rocks themselves are pregnant with life. But do these come from the rocks? Do these, does this moss and fern, does it come on its own? No, my friends. If you look around our universe, this world is exceptional. This world of all the planets we've explored is the one that has life. Why? Because it evolved here? Because it just happened? No, my friends. Because it was spoken into existence by the word of that one who says, I am the life. Those women would have remembered the words of Jesus, spoken time and time again, that he would be beaten, betrayed, and crucified. But on the third day, he would rise again. Even the enemies of Jesus remembered his words. That's why they had stationed the guard. But what good did their guard do now? What good did it do them to have provided, at their own expense, a hundred witnesses to the greatest event this world has ever known. The time when the creator of the world laid down his life and now took it up again. Suddenly, as the women are making their way to the tomb, they hear a crash, a mighty sound, an earthquake, a light, illumines the heavens. There at the tomb, a mighty angel comes down from heaven and rolls away the stone as if it was nothing more than a pebble. The Roman guard fall back in terror. They can do nothing. They're helpless except to witness the most grand and glorious event ever to this world has ever seen. Matthew chapter 28 describes this scene so beautifully. It describes this mighty angel, his countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him, and became like dead men. But notice the tenderness here in verse 5, 20, Matthew 28. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is not here. Where is he then, if he is not here? For he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I told you. And they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring word to his disciples. I love the way that the Gospel of John tells the story and the details that he adds. As the women hurry back and tell the disciples the wonderful news, Jesus is risen. They can't believe it, but Peter and John take off running. They run down to the tomb to look inside to see if it really is the way that the women are describing it. And, and I love how it says, John says, that other disciple, which was of course John, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. But Peter came and he looked inside. And when he saw that folded grave clothes, every detail, just the way Jesus would have done, because Jesus, after all, was the one 
who did it. He saw and he believed. But then they left and Mary Magdalene was left there at the tomb. And in spite of everything that she saw, in spite of the words of the angel, still her heart could not believe. Still she was filled with grief and sorrow that her Lord was gone. And the angel said to her, who are you seeking? Why are you weeping? And she turns, she turns away from an angel. She turns to go outside and meet someone that she should have known. And he says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? And through her blinded eyes, through her tears, she says, they've taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. If you have taken him away, tell me, tell me where you've taken him. And he says to her one word, in a way she knows all too well, Mary, Mary. And in that instant, she recognizes the voice of her Lord. And as she recognizes that voice, she falls at his feet in worship. Rabboni, teacher, master. Oh, the passion, the emotion of that reunion. My friends, do we have, do you have that relationship with Jesus? To where when you're missing him, you weep and mourn for him. To where when you hear him speak your name, you fall at his feet. He says to Mary, he says to her, don't cling to me. I haven't yet even ascended to my father in heaven. But as she lets go, as she, as she believes in her heart for the first time since that fateful Friday afternoon when she saw him hanging there on the cross, as she believes that he is alive, and she goes back, Jesus ascends to heaven. And there, in the presence of his heavenly Father, he presents the wounded hands, the wounded side, and his sacrifice is accepted. Unlike Abraham and Isaac, there was no angel to stay the hand. Jesus completed that sacrifice. There was no ram caught in the thicket. Jesus was that ram. He was that lamb. And because he died, and because his father accepted his sacrifice, there on that day when he ascended to heaven, before he even came back and showed himself to the other disciples, because the father accepts him, he accepts you, and he accepts me. That is the good news of the gospel. That is the reality of Jesus' love. People ask the question, how do we know? How do we know that the story of Jesus is true? We can talk about it, we can sing about it, but is it really real? My friends, I wanna ask you that question. Is it real? And how do we know? Well, the facts of Jesus' life, the fact that he lived at the time that the Bible says he did, the fact that he taught most of the things that he taught, these are undisputed facts of history. The fact that is disputed is who he really was. Was he just a man, just a good prophet? Or was he, as he claimed to be, the Son of God? The answer to that lies in the answer to another question. What happened after he died? Is his body still moldering in a grave? Was it stolen away, as many have said, by his disciples? Or was he, as the Bible records, raised to life by his own power? Well, the answer to that question would probably take a much longer video, but I want you to consider some things. Consider what if? What if the disciples had stolen away the body? How would that story be plausible since the enemies of Jesus had hired a guard of a hundred soldiers? A hundred soldiers, mind you. What were the disciples going to do? And after all, the disciples didn't even believe that he was going to rise. Not only that, but we have another evidence. 
Still to this day, you can go to the land of Palestine, and there outside of Jerusalem, you can find an empty tomb. There is not a tomb that contains the body of Jesus. There is not a tomb that contains his bones, but an empty tomb, a forever testament to the fact that someone was there and was risen and is now in heaven, pleading at the right hand of the Father for you and for me. For another thing, who in that culture, in that day, would write a story like the one we find in the Gospels, a story that says it was women who first encountered the risen Lord, in that day, when women were, were not seen as they are today, but seen as perhaps second-class citizens, the testimony of a woman was, was less credible than the testimony of a man. Who would write a story like it is written that the women would have been the first witnesses to Jesus' resurrection? Why was it written that way? Because, my friends, it's the truth. And you can't argue with the truth. And what does that have to do with us today? has everything to do with us today. In an instant, the reality for that small band of disciples was forever changed. It took them a little bit to go from disbelief to belief, but as the reality dawned upon them, they realized that this was the greatest hour of their lives, and indeed the greatest hour that the world had ever known. That the God of heaven, the God of the universe, had come down and walked and talked with them, had lived, had died, and now was resurrected to life. And he was still and is still their friend. They couldn't wait to tell the good news to the rest of the world. The God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God had done it through the sacrifice and through the mission, and through the death of Jesus, that in pouring out his life upon the cross, he had opened up a fountain of life for whoever will. In his life, as Jesus was walking the dusty paths of Judea and Galilee and Samaria in between, one day he sat down beside a dry and dusty town and right beside the well of Jacob. There a woman from Samaria came to him and he asked her, for a glass of water. When she answered in surprise, he said to her, if you knew who it was who was asking you, you would have asked of him, you would have asked of me, he says, and I would have given you living water. My friends, there on the cross, Jesus poured out his blood in a fountain that will never run dry, a fountain of forgiveness, a fountain of grace for you and for me, that no matter what we have done, his love is greater still. He took the penalty. He died in our place. But the message of that Sunday morning is a message for you and for me, my friends, because in rising from the dead, he gave us a promise that we too no longer need to fear death, but that we can have everlasting life. I love the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He speaks of this death of Christ and more importantly of his resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he goes through this whole, this whole uh, discussion about how the resurrection of Christ is the central key to all of the Christian doctrine, all of the Christian teaching. 
If Jesus had not risen from the grave, there would be no Christianity. There would be no hope. But because he is risen, we can go back all the way through the story of Jesus and reread it and reinterpret it and understand it now in the light not of someone who was a great teacher, not of someone who was just a great prophet, but of someone who was and is the life eternal. He says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. But in verse 20, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who are fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man, that is Christ, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. My friends, I don't know what trials you may be facing. I don't know what your background is. I do know that many of us, probably all of us, are facing a lot of uncertainty right now. With a virus going around, we can't be in churches. We can't live our lives like we normally do. We don't know what the future holds. But then again, we do. Because Jesus has promised us eternal life. Does that mean we won't have suffering? We won't have trials? We won't have heartaches? Perhaps even death in this life? No, all of those may come, for sure. But my friends, we know one who has conquered the grave. Jesus proclaims in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Praise God, my friends. Jesus has conquered the grave. We no longer need to fear the tomb. We have nothing in this life to fear. And after sin is completely destroyed, this earth is made over again, new and beautiful and wonderful. With Jesus and all whom he has redeemed, standing there by the river of life, standing on the sea of glass, Jesus proclaims, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come, and whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. My friends, this is my prayer for you, that of that fountain that was open, that fountain of forgiveness from Emmanuel's veins, that you will avail yourself, that you will accept his sacrifice, that you will allow him to give you that eternal life, so that we can be together forever in that world made new. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have in the power of the resurrection, that Jesus laid down his life and took it again, that assurance that we have from that empty tomb, that we no longer need to fear death, no longer do we need to fear the power of Satan, because Jesus has conquered the grave. Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more. And may you come soon to take us home to that land where we will forever be there by the tree of life and the river of life, forever in your presence, the presence of the one who died and lives again. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name.